Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of God and we believe it. We believe it. So, so glad you're here this morning. If you have a copy of the scriptures, go to the book of Ephesians, the New Testament book of Ephesians. It's on the right side of your Bible, chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 14. And I don't know if versus Lions is your home church, but make sure you have a church that teaches and preaches the scriptures faithfully. So Ephesians chapter 3. And so glad you're here. I could, it is true that pastors get a little anxious on Saturday night when they call for snow on Sunday morning. And so um, thank you for being with us. And our friends who are joining us around the U.S., Florida to now Nevada, thank you for joining us and our international workers also. And just be attuned to um, any you know, to our website, anything that's coming out, like prayer night tomorrow night, um, look at the way that may or may not happen regarding the weather and the roads conditions, so just keep clicking on that web website. And yes, when they did ask me to shoot that video, I said, you want me to do what? And so I said, okay, for, I'll do it, okay. So uh, let me pray, and then we'll get into our series, Lord, teach us to pray. So um, Jesus, we come, and we need a glimpse of your glory and your power, and um, show us how we can live. Holy Spirit, teach us the truth of who God is and how we can look at the world through the majesty and the wonder and the greatness of our God who loves us so deeply that he sent Jesus to come and die for us to be a means of salvation. We praise you for this and the church of Jesus Christ said together, Amen. And once again, we're practicing communion at the end of the message. You do not need to be a member of First Alliance Church uh, to join in communion with us. We do ask that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have accepted him for forgiveness of sins. And so anytime during the message, you can go grab one of these. We'll be taking it at the end. Well, we're in a series called Lord Teach Us to Pray. And this is the fourth January where we've looked at the topic of prayer um, as, a, as a church. So every January, we focus in on the topic of prayer because the disciples had one request of Jesus, um, meaning they wanted to learn something from him. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray because everything that Jesus did, I believe they saw, flowed from his prayer life. And as disciples, we pray. We want to pray because when we work, we get what we can do. When we pray, we join with God and we're able to get what he can do. God moves when his church praise. And Alliance churches all throughout the U.S. are praying. They're taking 40 days to, to pray. We're just taking the, we're kind of doing an abbreviated version of it. Um, but we're, but all Alliance churches all throughout the U.S. are focusing on, on prayer and calling upon their churches to pray that God would do a mighty work. And we're saying 10 minutes a day. Would you Carve out 10 minutes in your day to pray, to listen, to pray through scriptures, to write down what the Lord says, and just watch how our lives are different as a church and as Christians, victorious, not defeated, um, because we're praying. Just 10 minutes a day is the most important 10 minutes of any disciple's day as they call upon the Lord. But this is what I know. Just because we know the biblical teaching on prayer doesn't mean that we will actually pray. We've looked, this will be the third week that we study prayer. Um, we've looked at the, the Lord's Prayer. We looked at Matthew chapter 6, and we said, go into your closet and pray. But there's something in us that could just keep us from praying. Just because we know the biblical teaching doesn't mean that we'll apply it um, when it comes to prayer. But there is a truth, a three-word truth in the Bible that's found in the context of prayer that if we believe it deeply... I believe it'll light a fire when it comes to prayer, even if our prayer wood is all wet. Um, it will be like a strong wind in the sails of our prayer life. And it comes in the context of prayer. It's a three-word truth. Anybody can remember it. But if we believe it, and if we take it to 
the Lord, but with our, with our, our struggles, our challenges, um, it's, a cha- it's a game changer. This three-word truth starts with the one who started it all. This three-word truth starts with God, who's the creator of heaven and earth. Um, God, who the angels, as we see in the book of Revelations, cry, holy, 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 nonstop. God, whose mercies are new every morning. This truth starts with God. God, through Jesus Christ, who made the lame to walk, who allowed the blind to see, who fed 5,000, this truth starts with him. It starts with God. God, whom Jesus said with him, nothing is impossible. This truth that we believe when it comes to prayer starts with him. And then it's the second word is is, which is a possessive verb, which means it communicates something about him. Um, It communicates something about God, the third word, and it's this, he's able. The truth that our God is able, Um, meaning he possesses the means, the ability, the knowledge, the power to actually do something. You see, this truth that God is able is found in a prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians church. Look at what he says in verse 20. 20 says, now to him who is what? Able. Well, how able? To do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. You can't even comprehend how able God is. I mean, think about the most wildest thing. You're even scratching the surface of how able God is. And he ends this prayer believing that what he prayed can actually come about for the Ephesians church. You know why he believes it can come about? Because God is what? Able. God is able. And here's the central truth. The truth that God is able connects your current situation to God's limitless ability, who can do exceedingly more than we ask or imagine. And Paul takes his situation, the Ephesians church situation, he says, let's connect it to God, a God who is able, who's limitless in ability. You see, that changes everything. To the marriage who is struggling this morning, God is able. To the college student who has big decisions, God is able. To the high schooler who's overwhelmed by social pressures, God is able. To the medical professional who's exhausted, Constantly, God is able. To we who have our bodies who are wearing down and we feel the aches and the pains of that, God is able. To the one who's confused, God is able. To the one who feels weak, God is able. To the one who feels spiritually empty this morning and needs hope, God is able to do exceedingly more than we what? Ask or imagine. Is that how we pray? Paul gives us permission to pray in such a way to where we look at God and say, God, when I start praying and as I pray, I want to declare declare a truth that you communicated about yourself, and it's this. God, you're able. You see, when we know that God is able, our depression meets his hope, our addiction meets his freedom, our waywardness meets his leadership. Our anger meets his peace. Our confusion meets clarity. Our lack meets his supply. Our questions meet his answers. Our weakness meets his power. Our sin meets his grace. Our sadness meets his joy. And our inability meets his ability. When we remember, when we pray, that our God is what? Able. Our God is able. And so as we pray, we come and say, God, I want to declare a truth that you are able. Now, this truth is found in a prayer, as I said, that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesians church, which starts in verse 14. He says this, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Everything that he says, he says, I'm going to kneel in prayer, and I'm going to pray this for the Ephesians church, and it's an amazing prayer that he prays. And there's one theme that he has in this prayer, and it's this, he wants more. He wants more for them and more for himself. He's ever grateful for what he has received from God and yet never satisfied. 
And he has seen God do some amazing things in the life of the Ephesians community. At one point, um, Paul preaches and the Holy Spirit moves. And it's so powerful in the Ephesians community that people kind of bring all of their trinkets of witchcraft and burn them. And scholars say that that would be the equivalent, the amount of trinkets, to about 50 to $60 million worth of items. It'd be like you know, the pornography in this industry in LA just kind of coming to a screeching halt to where the business people had to stop, or sorry, had to have a meeting and say, what are we going to do? That's how powerful God has moved in the Ephesians community. Paul's not satisfied. He wants more. He wants more of God for himself, and he wants more of God for this church. And he believes he can have, receive more. Always grateful, never satisfied, because God is able He says this, for this reason, I kneel before the father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, there's going to be three things that he wants for them to be strengthened, to be rooted and established in love. He says this, I pray that of his glorious riches, he might strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that Christ, who's seated at the right hand of the father, through the Holy Spirit, would dwell in you, that you would be strengthened on the inside to have the capacity to know God. That's the first thing he prays for them. You see, your life has a capacity, it's only so much capacity. He's saying, I'm going a greater capacity for you that you may know Christ more. He goes on to say this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and established in love, very deep roots, Deep roots like a tree, so when the winds of challenge come, they don't blow you over. You're established in love, so you stand. May have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the full measure of the fullness of God. Now, I'm sure that the Apostle Paul, after praying that prayer, that you would know the full measure of God's love. He anticipated them saying, okay, Paul, don't get carried away. That's just way too much. And he anticipates that. That's why he ends this prayer with, now to him who is what? Able. He can do it. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly more than we ask or imagine, and he wants to do exceedingly more than we ask or imagine, so Christ can receive glory in the church forever and ever through all generations. He's looking to show he is able. Now, as you can obviously tell, I have glasses on. I mean, I can't hear anything if I don't have my glasses on. And so... uh, um, But these glasses are the lenses that I look through life. Um, We all have a lens regarding our thinking and our paradigms and our beliefs that how we look through life. Biblical truth shapes these lenses. Experience shapes these lenses. Media shapes these lenses. Conversations shape these lenses. It's how you look at life. Sometimes we can look through life that all I see is life's problems. That's it. For Paul, um, his problems were a prison wall. And he could have just been looking at that. His problem was a Roman guard outside. He could have just been looking at that. His problem was a Roman government that put him in jail. He could have been looking at that. But he's got a different lens. He's lens of this. God is able. God's bigger than that. And see, Paul is the illustration here that really shows that God is able because this God, now to him who is able, is a doxology, meaning he breaks out in worship. He breaks out in song. He finishes that part of the prayer, and then he says, now to him who is able, and he starts singing in a prison. Um, You don't start praising God spontaneously in a prison unless God truly is able. He truly is. Um, There were some spies that got sent to the promised land. And then you know the story of the nation of Israel. They said, okay, let's go spy them out. We got free from the nation of Egypt. We've gone through the... We're right here. We're right on the cusp. God has fed us. God has led us. 
And these, these spies, um, 12 of them, go, 10 come back and say, it's too big, too much of a challenge. We're like grasshoppers, but not Caleb and Jacob. They looked at the thing, situation through a different lens. They saw God's miracles in the past. They knew that God's promises for them going forward. And Joshua and Caleb said this, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we certainly can do it. And God always identifies himself with Caleb and Joshua. What lens are you looking at life with? Is it biblical truth that's communicated that now to him who is able, yeah, I've got problems, you've got problems, but if you're a Christian, you've got something bigger than your problems. Now to him who is what? Able. It's not just like positive thinking. No, it's the truth that God is able. Now, this is what I know, because some of you have questions, and I'm going to answer them right here. And I'll, I'll answer another one, the first one at the, at the end. Now, just because, God, just because God can doesn't mean that he will. We know this. But just because God hasn't doesn't mean he won't. And I think sometimes because God hasn't, we kind of give up. Just because God hasn't doesn't mean he won't. And the bottom line that God is love and that God is able and our hearts can rest securely no matter what the situation. And so you start your time of prayer because we come to our times of prayer with challenges. We come to time of prayer with heaviness. It's not heavy for him. We come to to times of prayer with weightiness. It's not weighty for him. Because God is able. And this is communicated all throughout the scriptures. Moses, you've got chariots behind you. You've got the Red Sea in front of you. What did you learn from that situation, Moses? I learned that God is able. You saw the anger in their eyes. You heard their empty stomachs and their roar. You felt the heat of their breath, Daniel. What did you learn from that situation? I learned God is able. He was so arrogant, David, and so loud, what did you learn? I learned that he was able, God is able. And those water pitchers that the wedding were, they were water. And our guests could be really unhappy. Servants, what did you learn from that situation? I learned our God is able. And they saw him die, the worst kind of death. They saw him in a grave for three days. And yes, they also saw him rise. They put their hands in his side. They ate with him. They heard from him. What did you learn from him? We learned that God is able. Each one of those situations, each one of those circumstances, people are in in situations they don't want, nor did they expect. But in that situation, God communicated the truth that I am able. How about you? What's your circumstance that you don't want? The challenge that you have? Something that if God could just take it away or get rid of it, um, maybe God is saying, this is a God is able moment for story that I'm writing in your life. Because just because I haven't yet doesn't mean I won't. Um, Now, how does the truth that God is able get, the three little words, God is able, get connected to our lives? Well, look at the first three words of verse 20. What does it say? Okay, uh, somebody somebody other than my wife. Verse 20. (laughs) Now to him. Now to him. Okay? If you're wondering what you should do, look to her. Okay? And so, now to him. God is able. Now to him. I mean, we can apply this so easily. Now, now is a statement, but now is also a declaration of time. We also often think that in the past, God was able. In the future, God is is able. But Paul didn't have to put the word now. He says, now, right now, in the now, in the here and now, in our now, in my now, in your now. When is God able? Say it with me, right? Right now. That changes everything. God's able right now. I saw this this past week. I had a meeting, and this was like, okay, here's this challenge. I don't know what to do. Here's that challenge. 
I don't have the answers. Here's this challenge. I felt my stomach get queasy. Here's that challenge. I don't know. Here's that challenge. Didn't see that coming. You ever have one of those meetings? You know what you do in those kinds of meetings? I said, you know what? Let's pray. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly more than we ask or imagine. God, you know everything about this meeting. We are trusting you, and we're going to wait for you to just show us what to do. But until you show us what to do and show us how you're going to supply and how to go forward, we are going to continue to believe now to him who is able. Everything changed. These problems came opportunities for God. Became opportunities for God. Now to him who is able. And we saw him move because he didn't change his circumstances, but he's definitely changed us. We were different on the inside. And we had eyes saying, God, show us what you're going to do. Because we truly believe that you could have stopped all of these, but you didn't. And these are opportunities to show the world who you are. What time is it? What time is it? 1013. Perfect. That's what I'm looking for. You know what time, you know what 1013 is? Right now, God could show himself as able. What day is it? January 16th, Sunday. January 16th, God could show himself as able. Christians look at time and days differently. Because they know that God could break in and God could do something right now. God could answer prayer right now. He sees our situation right now. Now God is able. Now, what's the uh, the last two words? To him. Now to him. You see, in your right now, turn to him. Look to him. Fix your eyes on him. Right now, not just as it comes up, look to him, turn to him. There it is, fix your eyes on him. Not just, um, okay, I did 10 minutes. I hope you do 10 minutes, but the 10 minutes carries into, okay, in any situation, I want to look to him. Because right now, he could show himself as able. Right now, I want to turn to him because he could show himself as able. What's the biggest thing that you're focusing on in your life? Is it a God who is able? Or is it just all the challenges? I I used to ride a motorcycle in Idaho, and I loved it. It was so great. And I so did. I mean, I tried to be Fonzie, but I'm always Potsy. And I just am, okay? Even the motorcycle didn't help. Um... (laughs) But I took a motorcycle class, and they said, okay, first thing in motorcycle riding is stay upright. Okay, we all got that, right? Right. What's the number one thing is staying upright? Balance. They said, no, your eyesight. You will go wherever your eyes go. Your eyesight, what you look at, directs directs yourself on a bike. It also directs your life. You need more than just hearing me on Sunday morning to fix your eyes onto him who is able. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prays that he prays that the eyes of their heart might be open to where they can see the incomparable riches of the greatness of his grace. Are the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your faith, faith open to say, now to him who is able. Now, I know that there are people here, Christians are not exempt from pain and questions and loss and struggle. Um, if God can, then why didn't he? It's easy for you, Paul, up there to say that. If God is able, then why hasn't he? Let's lean into this. If God chooses not to, Paul had unpanzered prayers. God, take it away. Three times this thorn in the flesh, take it away. No. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul had unpanzered prayers. If God chooses not to, this is a question of his sovereignty, not his ability. His sovereign love, knowing that struggle sometimes and pain, struggle conforms our lives in the image of Christ. Pain makes our testimony great about the ability of Christ to meet us and sustain us. Whether or not he will is his business. Believing that he can is our business. But knowing this, That Psalms 145, verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all that he does and faithful in all of that he does. He is loving towards his children 
all of the time. And we don't measure his love by just our limited perspective. Um, but because God is able, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And all of these situations are brought into our lives to, conf- to achieve the good purpose, which is to conform our lives into the image of Christ because he is able. Now, I'm like you. Um, I'm amazed at what this guy can do with chicken. I'm like you. I'm amazed at what Jacques Pepin can do with chicken. Who's with me? Am I? Oh, yes. Thank you, Ted. Okay. If you've not seen Jacques Pepin, he's phenomenal. I watch his videos sometimes. He's this French cook, and I don't watch a lot of French cooking, but when he's on, I'm glued in. And here's why. He became um, notoriety because when he was young, he was committed to taking simple ingredients, ingredients that when others passed by, the other French cooks of his day, and he says, I'm going to do something wonderful with them. And he took simple ingredients that, that other chefs has kind of discarded, and people were like, this is phenomenal. I mean, the other day I saw him, like he had like a three-day-old rotisserie chicken that he forgot about. He chopped up some mun- mushrooms, put in some onions, some scallions, three sticks of butter, maybe that's the key, and then all of a sudden he put some bed of lettuce, he does this, does that, boop, he's like, happy cooking. I, there's no way I could do that, and I love to cook. I mean, I do something like that, my kids are like, oh, what's the difference? He can take the stuff that others discarded, and all that stuff's in the hands of a master. When you come to prayer and say, God, you are able, you're placing all that stuff that you think should be discarded, and you're placing them in the hands of a master. And I wonder if God says when he's working in our lives, happy cooking, I love doing this because I'm able. So what? So what, really? God is able. How does that change anything? You know, Christians are called to be stewards. We have to give an account for our time, our talents, our treasures. Everything that we, own, everything that we think we own is God's and we're supposed to use him for his glory. So what? Okay, this is, here's the thing. Stewardship changes. We're not just good stewards of resources. We're good stewards of moments, challenges. You see, God, be a God is able steward of each moment of your life. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Whatever this challenge is, be a good steward of it. Don't waste it. Don't waste it with just prayers of God, oh, why? Say, God, I want to know what what you're going to do and how I can believe you. I'm going to be a good steward of this moment to show the world that, God, you are able. Help me steward this moment well with faith and trust and belief and prayers that are bold and courageous. Because I just don't want to hear about other stories. I want to about other people having stories of God, God is able. I want to know, God, you're able. Secondly, look for God gaps because he can fill them with God is able stories. God gaps are when you look at all of your resources of energy, time, and wisdom, and you believe that God has called you to something, but there's still a significant gap, like the walls of Jericho. How in the world is that going to happen? How are they going to be torn down? Um, God fills in the gap with himself. He will bring situations into your life that you have no idea why they are there and for what for. And gap, that gap leaves you anxious and wondering. He's brought that gap into your life because I'm going to fill it with God is able. And the world takes notice. And the walls of Jericho came tumbling down with trumpets. Lastly, you know, in life, we get caught up on the how. How is important. How is really important. Our how is ne- and how is no problem for God. No problem for God. Yes, truly, no problem. It is no problem. (laughs) He is looking for who. Who's going to trust me? Who's going to believe in me? Who's going to pray to me? Who's going to endure in faith and belief? Who's going to have a soft heart towards me? How is never the problem. 
He's looking for who? Um, God is able. Um, this changes everything. Where do you need to bring the truth that God is able into this area of your life? Um, maybe God is calling you today to change your prayer to not God take it away, to God show you are able and do something great and glorious and phenomenal. And maybe today after the service, you want to come and just at the altar say, God, I want to pray boldly that you would show yourself as able and maybe you don't change the circumstance, but you change me in this circumstance. That maybe you, that you produce joy, you produce peace, or I ask you to change the circumstance, bring the, bring the adult child home, bring the wayward um, friend to yourself, do the miracle, whatever it is, because I believe today that you are able. Um, the great testimony that God is able, the great statement that God is able is, comes at the moment we're going to do now. How are you going to reconcile sinful humanity to a holy God. How is that going to happen? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. Whoever believes in me, now we are born again. We're, we're sons and daughters of God. How did all of that happen? Because God is what? Able. Um, the night that Jesus was betrayed, um, he took bread, simple bread. And he said, this bread represents my body that will be broken for you. And bread was, it was just ordinary and it was part of everyday life. And Jesus says, you know, you bring me into the aspects of your everyday life. Um, with the disciples, he, Jesus said, this bread represents my body that was broken for you. Let us take together. And we stand amazed at the wonder and the grandeur of forgiveness, Father. Father. And you are able to cleanse us from our deepest sin. You are able to make us clean in your sight. Because nothing is too hard for you. And the greatest demonstration of your power is that you took sinful humanity and brought us into relationship with the Holy God. For this, we declare you are able. And also the night that Jesus was betrayed, um, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents the blood of the new covenant. For nothing can forgive sin in the sight of a holy God except the shedding of blood. Let us take together. And just take a moment and rest in the truth that the cross is the great demonstration of the power of God. And if you're here today and you want to pray about anything, we'd love to pray with you. Um, take your burdens to God in this time of worship, in this time of prayer, that which is weighing you down to God, lift it up to him. And sing this song as a declaration of, trace, of, of trust and hope and praise to him. For God, we praise you that you are able. Let's stand together for worship as we close.